place since 2017. He's originally from Pabano First Nation, which is a Mi'kmaq community near Bathurst, New Brunswick. And he is the founder and inaugural chair of the Atlantic Association of College and University Services, um, the Indigenous Services Division. Raymond has taught previously in the Department of Religious Studies, and um, I'm going to let you all know, if you don't know already, that he will soon be teaching in the Department of English as a full-time faculty member. Uh, so congratulations very much on that new role, Raymond, and we are very grateful to have you here with us today. Uh, I'll just give you a bit of a rundown of, of what's happening after that. We'll then hear a poem from um, our, our poet here with us today and soon to be SMU alumnus, Tammy Williams. Uh, congratulations, Tammy, on your recent successful thesis defense. Tammy is a Mi'kmaq consultant, a program coordinator and teacher at the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center. And she's done that while completing her master's degree in women and gender studies. Her research focuses on cultural safety and decolonizing methodologies. Our main event is a panel discussion with some of the book's talented contributors, uh, and that will be moderated by the editor, Dr. Bernita Bungeon, uh, our associate professor and newly tenured at St. Mary's University in the Department of Social Justice and Community Studies. Her research examines organizational and institutional power relations with a focus on colonial encounters and nation building within academic spaces and workplaces. Dr. Bungeon is deeply committed to the academic well-being of Indigenous, Black, and students of color who are often seen as bodies out of place and to hear her and to her responsibilities and responsiveness regarding the complexity of indigenous settler of color relations. She is currently the faculty coordinator for the Racialized Students Academic Network, RSAN, and works with racialized students and international students at various universities to promote their scholarship, their rights, their well-being, and self-advocacy in the areas of academia, tenancy, and mental health. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to uh, Raymond to lead us in land acknowledgement. It's great to be gathered here in Chibuktok on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, the Skijielnu. Uh, Skijielnu is the ones that walk on the earth. And looking at all these squares um, on Zoom, it's so nice to see all this energy come together, all these people coming together in community. And it's really good medicine. I'd like to thank Benita for inviting me and for editing this book and then for all the students who contributed. I was lucky and privileged to know uh, most of you uh, through your academics and uh, I'm just so proud of everybody. I'm proud of everybody for attending, uh, for writing the book and everything. So I want to start everything off. Uh, we lose, we say, after last year, uh, you know, welcome to uh, Mi'kmaq and we start with a song. So I'll sing a, a short song called Jijakumich Gedebek Young, the spirit song, uh, just to recognize all the hard work and that good medicine. Uh, going through the table of contents, I'm like, wow, this is great decolonization work. Um, it's from students and it can really inform all of us and it enriches our community. So thanks again to everybody. Yo ya hi e ya hi yo ya hi e Yo ya hi e ya hi yo ya hi e Yo ya hi e ya hi yo ya hi e Yo ya hi e ya hi yo Abu gwan winin dan deli El nua mal kal tu die Abu gwan winin dan deli El nua osun marie Abu gwan winin dan deli El nua kera begi arie Abu gwan winin nis kami nu Muktu ada su alie Yo ya hi e ya hi yo ya hi e Yo ya hi e ya hi yo ya hi e Yo ya hi e ya hi yo ya hi e Yo ya hi e ya hi yo 
he go he got he go he got one ali no day one ali no danae Taho, good medicine, everybody. Thanks. Thank you so much, Raymond. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this very special day while um, so much is happening around the world um, and really recognizing um, how um, we're all trying hard in different ways to keep our well-being during this time. And I also want to recognize that as some people are accessing the vaccine and that we're posting this up on Facebook, that there are millions of people who are not accessing the vaccine um, and who are, um, their families are getting smaller and, and smaller. I want to also take a moment to thank the SMU Patrick Power Library. Thank you, Shauna, for working with us. Thank you, Fernwood, for just being brave, repeatedly being brave and doing the work out there. A special thank you to Fazila um, for, um, well, thank you, Fernwood, for hiring Fazila. Then thank you, Fazila, for being a person of color who I could work with. Um, and it made a really big difference in how we moved through this. I want to, we're collaborating here with Women's Studies at uh, Women and Gender Studies and RSAN, the Racialized Students Academic Network. I want to congratulate um, Raymond on his new position. This will then be, I believe, the first, uh, sorry, it'll be the one Indigenous professor in the arts in our university. So this is a, 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 a big moment. I want to congratulate ML Way and Sailaja Krishnamurthy for also this month with me receiving tenure um, uh, and ML for tenure and promotion. I know you're on right now, so congratulations. So this book came about um, through, through my work starting at University of British Columbia, both Okanagan and UBC on Coast Salish territories, right down to on Mi'kmaq at St. Mary's University. And it came through various conferences um, and we were able to put it together um, within a year. And I wanna recognize Vanessa Mitchell, some, some of these folks on the call, Fallon Matthews, Iseline Phillip, Wayne Desmond, Zane, um, who's on the call right now, Maggi, Dorothy Christian, who's also on the call, Tammy Williams, uh, Jyotika Samant, Natalie Lozano Nera, and Artia Rumagam and Yvonne Brown for uh, being part of this collection. And we all have uh, uh, relations here. We have poems from Beverly McLillan, um, poems from Timmy Idris, and uh, Jyotika, as well as Diane Obed, who's also on this call. Um, so I'll just share a little bit from the book. This is actually from the first chapter. Um, so obviously today is a very exciting time. The book, the book, the book is in my hands finally. And it was dropped at my home uh, by Fazila and their partner. So thank you for doing that. So you can officially purchase that or request for it. Um, everybody in RSAN, all the students in RSAN will get their own copy and the contributors also. So this book centers the voices of Indigenous Black and students of color within the academy in Canada on Turtle Island. It draws from papers presented at racialized students conferences or panels and uh, by racialized students under my mentorship, as well as the intellectual collaborations with peers that center critical race, feminist, intersectional frameworks. The collection includes art, photographs, poems, spoken word, thesis chapters, and academic papers from those that dare to create hybridized, transformative spaces of good relations, knowledge creation, and community building. 
Such gatherings are critical and rare academic spaces that ensure students further develop their theoretical vision based on their intersecting identities, histories, and struggles while they promote their individual and collective well being. The collection is the first of its kind to envision in relation to the positionalities and leadership of the diverse writers across geographies on Turtle Island within a transnational context. Their creations and contributions are grounded on unceded territories of the Coast Salish, the Okanagan, and the Mi'kmaq. The book discusses the experiences of pain, trauma, forms of violence, um, uh, within the colonial context and the academy and larger societies. Stories of trauma, exclusion, displacement, and pain across generations and migrations clearly connect to imperialism. Many of the contributors' journeys in and out of academic spaces include feeling out of place, being an imposter or not belonging. Academic institutions within Canada, a white settler society, remain troubling sites of racial exclusion and racial disentitlement, lacking critical Indigenous and race scholarship and scholars. But this book also emphasizes the ways we survive and strive to build communities of care while carefully creating strategies of well being and resistance. Networks, mentorship programs, and conferences become pivotal sites of learning and engagement, but also of retrieval and remembering, such as where we came from and the path we will choose to move forward. The journey is very painful, but along the way, we have come to this brave space of alternative teaching and cathartic healing. Academia in Canada can be understood as a site of colonial encountering of differently positioned subjects within simultaneous contact zones, like classrooms, instructor offices, libraries, group lab work, student campus services and departments. Renessa Mawani refers to these colonial contact zones as a space of racial intermixture, a place where Europeans, indigenous peoples, or descendants of enslaved Africans and racial migrants came into frequent contact, a conceptual material geography where racial categories and racisms were both produced and productive. So university spaces such as classrooms are powerful sites of socio-geopolitical, local and global intermixing of international students, domestic students and instructors across the intersections of racialization, class, gender, trans, non-binary and ability. While the academic journey of racialized students often begins with difficult and painful moments, this book centers the academic well-being created from forging transformative spaces and relations in and beyond the university. Academic well-being is the capacity of academic institutions to carefully conceptualize and implement with relevance the policies, pedagogies, curricula, and services that promote the mental, physical, and intellectual wellness of students. Further, it is when academic institutions fail to build and deliver on this capacity that students search for spaces of comfort, mentorship, resistance, networking, and survival to then promote their individual and collective well being. In the book, I focus on three particular themes. So the, the contributors fall in three themes barriers to academic well being, acts of resilience and resistance to white supremacy within the academy, and third, the nurturance of reciprocity, care, and kinship. And I just want to end here. Uh, the last chapter is uh, written with. Uh, uh, Yvonne Brown and I, who was my mentor and continues to be, and I'm just going to read a clip and end here and then introduce the panelists. I recall the first time Yvonne invited me for dinner at her home. A two bedroom apartment in East Vancouver flooded with books and papers and articles. The walls were covered with mementos and art from her travels and gifts from students and colleagues demonstrating gratitude. She began by saying, let me introduce you to what a typical slave meal would look like. The meal comprised 
salted codfish, which she said was historically important from Newfoundland during the reciprocal trade in salted cod for molasses and rum from the British colonies of the Caribbean. Yvonne explained that this salted cod, along with salted mackerel and shad, were the main protein sources for hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans doing backbreaking work from sunup to sundown on the sugar plantations. I watched Yvonne cook and flake the cod, which she combined with sauteed onions, peppers, garlic, and tomatoes. She then added the canned ackee, a fruit that came over on the slave ships from the West, from West Africa during the importation of captive bodies um, up to three months voyage through the Middle Passage. Boiled green bananas and breadfruit accompanied the ackee and codfish main course. She told the story of Captain Bly, whom the sugar plantation owners commissioned to go to the South Pacific to find food trees and perennials to feed the hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans. She served coconut water as the beverage. After the meal, we talked and talked and talked. I mean, she mostly did the talking. And I respectfully absorbed everything like a sponge. I asked questions endlessly such as, Yvonne, where did the salt come from for the salted fish? And then we went to her bookshelf to look up the history of salt and cod. She always shared and responded generously, pulling books off her shelves or from the floor to show me and even read passages from them. This tremendous gift of, gift of generosity and care that Yvonne demonstrated is immeasurable. It is all encompassing. This way of being was instilled in me inch by inch, moment by moment, breath by breath. She showed me how I could make my deep commitment to my current and past students as I witnessed their growth, risks, perseverance as bodies who have repeatedly been told and taught to be bodies out of place, particularly in academia. So thank you, Yvonne. She's busy revising her book right now but probably the next book launch will be Yvonne and, and Benita. And I know many of our students, uh, Yvonne Brown and I were able to teach a course at St. Mary's just this term. Um, and we taught a similar course that she taught to me 25 years ago. And, um, and that's part of what transnational kinship relations are about. And that's a big part of, of the book. So I want to um, invite um, and, and introduce Arti Arumagam. Arti Arumagam is an international student from Malaysia. Arti, are you wearing the same outfit that you had worn yes. for this conference? Yes. So that is actually Arti. This is actually <laughs> a real picture from a conference. Um, so she's a student from Malaysia studying at St. Mary's University. Uh, in Women and Gender Studies. I happen to be her supervisor. Arti's MA research examines the housing experiences of international students in Jibuktuk. They work as a client support worker at Shelter Nova Scotia and the facilitator and assistant of gender-based violence prevention project at the YMCA Center for Immigrant Programs. Thanks for being with us, Arti. I will introduce now Fallon Matthews, is an Afro Ilnu woman and writer who is pursuing an interdisciplinary doctorate at Dalhousie University. Um, so Yenda, we're, we're, I don't know if you want to feature Fallon. Um, her studies include psychoanalytic theory, cin uh, cinema, history, gender studies, and critical race theory. She completed her MA in women and gender studies at St. Mary's University. I should say, when I came here in 2016, Fallon was my first TA, and I was her second reader for her degree. Um, and so it's very, very special to have both RT and Fallon here. Um, and we have now Diane Obed. Diane Obed, before I introduce her, I met her the first, I think, first month or two that I landed here. And Diane um, was a very powerful person in showing me um, a, a place, and we call it the Oaks. It's behind um, St. Mary's. And we walked there, and she, I remember you took off your shoes, and you walked barefoot on the grass, and, um, and you shared how this is such an important place 
um, and how important it is to be to be able to have a place away from the academic buildings and spaces uh, for respite, for healing, for care. And I really want to honor you um, for introducing me to that. Diane is an Inuk woman mixed with white settler ancestry. She's a mother, writer, and community member, originally from Hopedale, Nunyatsiavut, Labrador, currently living, studying, and working in Mi'kma'ki, Nova Scotia. Diane graduated with her MA in Atlantic Canada Studies from St. Mary's University. She's currently enrolled in the Educational Foundation's PhD program at Mount St. Vincent University. And I would like to introduce our discussant, Dr. Sailaja Krishnamurti. Sailaja, thank you for being here. You have been such an important part of all our lives and why we've been able to accomplish some of the things we have, both the students and myself. She's an associate professor of religious studies and women and gender studies at St. Mary's University. Her research takes a critical race feminist approach to religion and representation in the South Asian diaspora and in contemporary culture. She's currently working on a book about South Asian religions in comics and graphic novels. So we will begin with the panel and we'll begin with Arti, then Fallon, then Diane, and then Silaja will uh, take some time to, to reflect on their presentation. And then we'll have about 20 minutes for the Q&A. Arti, please begin. Hoi, um, wanakam. My name is Arti Arumugam. Arti is my first name and Arumugam is my father's name. I am a temporary settler, migrant to the lands of the Mi'kmaq people. And I am going to share in the chat some of the terms I'll be using that I hope would be useful to you as I speak in the next seven minutes. Okay, there we go. Um, my chapter is chapter 11 in the book and it's titled, The Embodied Transformation of a Racialized International Student on Coast Sel Selish and Mi'kmaq Territories. To give you a bit of a background as to why I talk about embodied transition is because I read in a Reader's Digest book about a man who was found frozen um, in an, uh, snow, probably due to an avalanche. Um, and it was found in his bowels that the sands that he had eaten, the food that he had eaten, contained the grains of sand, which they were able to uh, trace back to where he was from and how he has traveled, he did travel from where he was to the neighboring territories in search of food. And I want to reflect on that connection to the title of my work and why I approach um, what it means to go through uh, a transformation that's um, based in your body, in your psyche, in your mind, and very much so in your soul. And I would like to take this opportunity to remind myself, but also to thank all the indigenous peoples of the Turtle Island who are here today in this talk, but also who have been very present in my life in terms of like being able to give me the access, not just to your lands, uh, to the bodies of water, but also to your knowledges, to your medicines, to your healing. Um, I have received gifts in the form of medicines from you and in forms of knowledge and support, love and care. and. It is from the bottom of my heart that I share the deepest gratitude. I also want to acknowledge my parents, my brothers, who are not able to participate today because it's midnight at home. Also, my parents, as a, as a first generation student, my parents have not been to university and they would not understand my academic language. So it is with a very broken heart I share that they probably would not be able to understand what I've written but I'm very, very happy to share that my brothers will be able to. And I think that's the very start of that journey. Um, I do want to share a bit about what I wrote in the book in terms of um, why I made the embodied transformation that I did. So I talked a bit about constructing a critical eye. When I first arrived uh, on the lands of the Musqueam people in post Salish territories uh, to study at UBC, 
in 2010. I came in um, as a lower middle class demo girl who was just grateful to have an opportunity to study at a globally renowned uh, post-secondary education. Little did I know, when I walk into the classes of Dr. Sunira Tubani, Dr. Benita Banjan, Raga, that I was going to experience an extremely intense internalized psyche transformation. Um, and the conversations that we had in those classes transformed me because I had access to the knowledges of like queer brown women who were powerful and grounded in their knowledges. And towards the last two years of my uh, education, to the, uh, I had access to the knowledges of uh, indigenous professors who were brilliant when it comes to talking about resistance. And to contextualize it a bit, when I first came, I was very bent on making sure that my family would have access to a comfortable life. And that's what I saw education was. Because back in Malaysia, police brutality and um, uh, Sedition Act used to quieten my people who are, um, came into Malaysia as the laborers of indentureship was very strong. So I was um, taught to survive first before thriving. But when I was in those classes, I realized that in order to thrive, I would have to go back to my roots. And it was not a very easy decision to make because having a social justice degree that has the title race, gender, sexuality, and social justice would not allow me to have a life that I would say comfortable capitalistically. So I have to say, I had to make a very educated knowledge from my heart to come to that decision. I remember sitting at the Museum of Anthropology that oversees the North Pacific Ocean back on Musqueam territories and sitting down and having a conversation with myself about what it means to live truthfully to myself, to meaning to, to choose to live in my truth. And I decided at that moment that it was not gonna be an easy journey of losing people in my life. And I did, but those who have stayed with me have supported me tremendously in this journey. Sometimes I joke with my, um, current partner about like how having chosen to have the critical eye actually reduces our um, livelihood and the years you're going to be on this beautiful earth. Uh, but that's a decision that many of us choose to make. And I do want to say um, as a way to wrap this up that I chose to like be able to ground it in my truth in the knowledge of my people and um, indigenous people and like racialized people around the world because I wanted to be able to support um, marginalized folks by being able to embrace who we are and in our powers, in our strengths. And I currently work at the Center for Immigrants um, program at the YMCA where I work predominantly with folks who have survived war, who came here as, uh, refugees who have been accorded PR. And I can't tell you how much strength I witness from like the youth that I work with and the knowledges and stories that they have. And I feel extremely privileged to have had the knowledge that I did. And I have vowed to myself to be able to share those knowledges that I have had access to um, and move and bring it to forward to um, everyone who I cross path with in my life. And very quickly, I'm just going to read something from my chapter. Through hours, I understood the mechanisms of how I do not belong by examining how academic institutions became sites of racial exclusion and racial disentitlement with the lack of critical race and indigenous scholarships and scholars. I was given three options. Adopt the status quo by fully embracing the objective academic system radicalize my education based migration through critical indigenous race and feminist scholarship or navigate the balance between two. Fanon, Franz Fanon wrote that in the colonial situation, the colonized are confronted with themselves. 
I, as the colonial intellectual, eventually chose to ground myself in the knowledges um, of racialized people to deepen my processes of interrogating, interrogating colonial narratives about both Canadian and Malaysian spatial and social politics. It was only after I was able to go through that process that I attended my second reader's classes like Dr. Saila Jakrishnamurti's class that talks about religion, spirituality, and work a bit more towards actually healing. And uh, the works of uh, Dr. K uh, Candice DeBesic. It is simply empowering to talk a bit about like what yoga means for people of color. So I highly recommend that um, folks look at some of the things that I've shared in the chat. And if you have any questions, please do send them to me or ask during the question uh, period. Thank you. Thank you so much, RT, for that. And um, I want to bring my, my friend and colleague, Tammy Williams, to, to be with us. Um, again, congratulations, Tammy, for uh, um, uh, defending your thesis successfully and just being on this journey. And I know you've been looking and thinking about, I don't know if you're still thinking about the PhD, but we're mm -hmm. still here with you and we're still uh, supporting you. Please share your, your poem and, and position it if you want. Thank you. Um, so they, uh, there was a brief introduction of me. I am a Mi'kmaq grandmother and I'm also a teacher at the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center. And this poem came about because we were doing a cultural study on uh, Mi'kmaq poets. And we had focused for a short time on Rebecca Thomas, who is the Mi'kmaq Poet Laureate. Um, and in 2016, she had published a poem and, and done a, she'd done a, a spoken word on a poem called Edoabdmuk, which means two-eyed seeing. And while I was writing this, I was also going through my own decolonization journey and um, just dealing with a lot of uh, realizations and, and insights into myself and uh, into colonialism in general. So as I was sitting with my students, encouraging them to write poems based on the Edouabdemuk poem that Rebecca Thomas had written, I also wrote my own and it's called Decolonizing Intentions. Rebecca Thomas says, don't feed us your good intentions. We don't mind your modern inventions, but your intentions are full of hidden motivations. While you subjugate our conventions with decades of litigations that you deny our race exterminations. Fingers are crossed behind your backs as your other hand extends in reconciliation, spreading misinformation about withholding tax, giving settlers ammunition for degradation. As we try to argue the facts, settlers' ears are filled with colonial wax. We fight to protect this land, thinking seven generations ahead. So when water stops flowing and we stand on empty riverbanks full of poison sand, and as we write letters to ever-changing letterhead, there's no one to blame on the witness stand. Your good intentions are corrupted by money and power and can't be disrupted. So when we cry for the land and poison water, your good intentions mean nothing for my granddaughter. When she learns of your intentions based on your greeds, she will decolonize her world with her indigenous knowledge and deeds. That's it. Thank my you granddaughter so is one year old now. <laughs> That's what we were hearing a little bit of. Actually, my cat is is protesting uh, at the top of the stairs. <laughs> okay, okay. I want to also say that Tammy Williams, um, besides the poem, has a chapter in the book. It's called Envisioning an Intersectional Resilience Mentorship Program for Indigenous and International Students. And I think that really speaks to um, 
some of the great work happening here in Gijibuktuk, um, particularly in Arsan, where that that is such a powerful place of intermixing of African Black Nova Scotians, Indigenous students, and international students, um, and other students of color. And uh, Tammy presented that at the third uh, SURF conference. So that's called the Critical Indigenous Race Feminist Studies Conference, which tomorrow uh, will be the fourth one on um, the racialized precarity of racial the, the precarity of racialized students labor. Thanks, Tammy. Fallon Matthews. Um, yes, I'm very happy to be here and grateful. Um, and uh, my cats will probably make appearances throughout my talk. And if they do not, then that is ironic because they have been coming frequently. But um, yes, I'm very grateful as well to be featured in this book. Um, my chapter is chapter three, um, and it deals with the theme of uh, plagiarism and uh, appropriation uh, that is often uh, afflicting marginalized positionalities within academia and even elsewhere. Um, and uh, I also just want to acknowledge all of the, uh, the help and support I've gotten from my elders and other people who are currently attending. Um, Benita uh, was my second reader for my master's degree and she was just amazing and a huge beacon of support. Um, and my supervisors were Silaja and Michelle who are currently in here. So uh, that was uh, their co-supervisor. So I was just really happy about that. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be doing my current interdisciplinary doctorate at Dalhousie, which focuses on cinema and media studies. So um, that's, that's also super important in terms of like supporting people. And I talk about this in the chapter I wrote uh, under one of the subheadings called Lift As We Climb. Um, so it's it's like that's why the other thing like I'll also talk about this at tomorrow's conference but um representation just isn't enough it's important to actually help and foster more people to continue their journeys and or just be supported in other roles and positively use the knowledge they've gained and pay it forward and um then I think of my mom who actually gave me my name and um, I don't know if that kind of foreshadowed my interest in drama and cinema and media studies because I was named after a character on a soap opera called Dynasty. And she named me after Fallon Carrington. Um, she was, her explanation was that I looked just like her when I was born because it looked like my hair was combed or something. But, um, but yeah, I, that actually drew me into create like, that's it foreshadowed my interest in creative writing and um, other arts. So when I was in those realms of art and creative writing, and then later on when I was looking at academic writing and academia, and even just being in classes, I started to notice that um, I would like write or repeat things or raise points in class, and they didn't really get as much of a response or attention and often tended to be overlooked. But then I would have uh, people who were in those classes who were more privileged positionalities, who were louder and like wanted attention, who would literally like parrot exactly what I said to the applause and acclaim of like other instructors and other students. So, um, and then I also looked at like industries like creative writing and filmmaking where a lot of stuff is produced behind the scenes and people are not given like um, credit for that. And I also kind of observe this as a, just kind of being a ghostwriter as well. Like I've been involved in very lucrative projects, but not credited, which is like the, the agreement of a ghostwriter. But still, I just found it ironic that there are these super privileged positionalities who are profiting immensely off of stuff that I've written. But if I submit the same thing under my own name, it's likely to be rejected because it's seen as like too different or too radical. But then when it's, so like that, it made me think about how like, if 
only I had like a puppet who occupied some privileged positionalities or contacts. And I could be like a ventriloquist where I could just put in the content that I want to share. And then if it's coming from that um, specter, then it becomes readily consumed and embraced and accepted. But otherwise, if it's coming from me, it's it's questioned and doubted and often rejected. And um, so that's a that was a realization that I was very angry about and I'm still kind of angry about, but I was way more angry about it when I wrote this chapter. Um, and uh, sadly, I have observed that like it hasn't really changed despite how avidly people uh, claim that they are for diversity and reconciliation and repatri repatriation and all of these nice buzzwords that sound cool on paper and are great to conceptualize and imagine. Um, nothing really manifests because the same people continue to profit and be applauded while marginalized people barely manage to exist within spaces in which their creativity and brilliance, et cetera, is just kind of exploited. And um, I always use the saying, uh, which I, I learned through another professor at St. Mary's University who is not really present, but is also in, uh, in religious studies, whose name is Adnan. He uh, famously said that um, oftentimes people will, or privileged positionalities will go amongst marginalized positionalities and literally mine those spaces and peoples for goodies so they can like bring it and make their mark and not even cite or acknowledge the contributions or where, where they found that. And then it becomes seen as original by the person who stole it. So um, uh, I'm just gonna quickly read like, a part of the chapter that uh, towards the end. And um, also I wanted to mention that I also have a neurodegenerative disease called FARS and my neurologist who also happens to be immensely privileged in terms of positionality. Every time I see him, his response or his opening thing is always just like, oh, are you still doing your academic programs? Because when I was diagnosed, one of his first statements to me was just like, oh, well, I've never known anyone with this who's gotten a master's. And then after that, it was a, he's like, oh, I've never known anyone who's gotten a PhD in this. And then I'm just like, oh, okay, that's, that's not really as inspiring as you're, I don't know if you're trying to make it encouraging, but like he, he does that all the time. He's just like, oh, I've, I've never known anyone who could do this. Oh, I've, I'm surprised you're able to do this. Well, well, it's like, it's like you told me to be to be encouraged and not give up, even though you gave me this diagnosis. But at the same time, you were expressing like shock that I am still like like doing stuff. So yeah, that's a, I'm sure like there's also uh, some pieces in this book too about like uh, systemic racism and medical racism, whether it is unwitting or not. So. Yeah, that's another reason I really recommend people read this book in, in its entirety. But um, for the section of my chapter, um, I let myself more in the person I could have been if things had worked out better for me. If I could have drawn more aces from the cards I had been dealt. I say this urging people to critically consider that I speak not just from my heart, but from experience. Before anyone makes a play to weigh their own cards as more or less than, note that I speak as an indigenous black poor, clinically depressed and anxious cis woman with a rare neurodegenerative disease. In a Eurocentric and cis heteronormative patriarchy that avows abled brains and bodies with white skin and cash, I do not exactly have a winning hand. Acknowledging my identity allowed me to draw upon disparities that augmented my afflictions. It is more than understandable that amid a rigid binary capitalist white supremacy, I would grieve. And moreover, that my grief would be denied or disdained by privileged positionalities. Often the calcifications 
that mark the bilateral lesion of my brain strike me as somewhat of a blessing because the symptomatic hallucinations afford me some reprieve in a world wherein I often do not want to be fully, if at all, present. The cards you are dealt are not bad in themselves. They are just substandard in accordance to a game that was, is, and will continue to be rigged. A game defined by its formation, foundation, and continuation of iniquitous interpersonal, social, and economic conditions that systemically issue and execute communities of color, sickness, and poverty. A game whose prominent players exploit and monetize the suffering of said communities through sanctimonious, superficial social justice ventures. So um, that is one section of it. And again, I am very happy that uh, I was a part of this project. Thank you, Fallon, um, for your contributions. We're looking forward to your new piece tomorrow. Um, and, and Diane, will you wrap us uh, up here, the panel, with your poem? Yes, sure. Um, so yeah, thank you, Benita, for inviting me, and thank you, Raymond, for the beautiful song in the introduction. Um, so I wrote a poem uh, four years ago uh, after I had returned from my field work uh, that I had done for my master's from my homeland, uh, Nunatsiavut, and I had many complicated feelings for, of working through internalized colonialism, of feeling like an informant for the academy, of going to my community and gathering knowledge and then communicating it back to the academy. And in that process, trying to decolonize and not perpetuate colonial practices of, ex of extractivism and exploitation of our communities. So this poem, um, I wanna thank Benita in part because she really allowed me to recognize that that discomfort and, and difficult feelings and emotions are not necessarily a bad thing. Being unsettled is a part of a process of, of decolonizing. Um, and it's taken me a long time. Uh, and I'm still in many ways working through internalized colonialism. And specifically, the internalized colonialism is I have been conditioned as an Inuk, as a mixed with white settler ancestry to collude with white fragility, meaning that I am not to call attention to whiteness and to maintain the comfort of white people. And so, you know, this, this poem is angry <laughs> uh, and, and uh, purposefully so uh, to help me to reclaim my um, ability to express the full spectrum of emotions that we feel as indigenous peoples, uh, as just human beings. Um, so the poem is a form of talking back to the academy, um, allowed me to also write through a writer's block um, related to this idea of being an informant. Um, so the poem is titled Unbecoming, Decolonizing the Settler Gaze. And it's inspired by Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang's article called Unbecoming Claims, Pedagogies of Refusal in Qualitative Research. Um, and so also poetry is a creative expression allowing for that processing and alchemizing of difficult emotions. For me, uh, emotional literacy is just as important as intellectual literacy. Um, of, being able to, to work through a difficult past, being able to manage emotions that come up. And I see creative expression as a form of trauma-informed and holistic teaching. And I wasn't necessarily encouraged um, in my master's to, to be creative. And so I see now as an educator moving forward, the importance of holistic forms of teaching and learning um, being trauma-informed. Okay, so I'm gonna share the poem. Time goes by really quickly. Five minutes. So it goes, I'm not your typical Eskimo. 
I'm not your idealistic fur wearing, raw meat eating, sculpture making, snow building, exotic version of a sexy savage. I'm not your token Eskimo or Inuk. I don't exist to satisfy your perpetual curiosities, nor your set insatiable settler consumption, nor your viewing pleasure. Can you feel the chill of ice and snow flowing through my veins invading your space this time? Continual contention with the performative display of my existence for your learning, for your entertainment, Objecti objectification of my cultural practices, losses, and uprising does not perform for your eyes nor for your understanding. I exist outside of your perception of me taking my power back. Mysterious personalities cannot be contained within your compartmentalized boxed projections. My ethnographic refusal is bound by generations of living histories, living stories, whispering secrets only I can hear. We protect the sacred, we preserve, we persist for and among ourselves. I will share what I wanna share with you. These walls or degrees do not define or validate me. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. I remember when I first heard you read that outside was the a day we were celebrating the 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 indigenous uh, uh, gathering in the Oaks um, and and how powerful that was. And congratulations to you too in completing your masters. I know that it was quite a journey. And I think a lot of these stories are stories of being grateful for good relations, but it is a, uh, it also, it's also recognizing some of the, the real visceral colonial violence that happens within the academy. So thank you again to all of you and I'll pass it on to Sila Jayakrishnamurti. Thank you. Um, I, before I start speaking, I just want to note that I think like probably many people on this call who are um, uh, in Mi'kma'ki, I have children at home uh, running around the house and being very loud. Um, and so I apologize for any background sound you might hear. Um, I, I really uh, want to begin by thanking uh, Benita uh, and thanking Arthi and Tammy and Fallon and Diane for their wonderful contributions. And I'll say more about their work in a few minutes. Um, I don't wanna take up a lot of time and space here because I think there are lots of people um, on the Zoom who are gonna to wanna to ask questions and maybe share some of their own thoughts. Um, I want to offer a few thoughts about this book and the project behind it. Um, and then I have a few questions for our panelists. Um, one of the most amazing things about this book, I think, is the way that it makes visible what it means to build good relations. As a professor, um, this is really important to me because I think academic books really tend to invisibilize or obscure the connections we have to each other. Um, and I think there'll be lots of graduate students and, and, and professors, I imagine, who have um, struggled with these issues um, with us today, thinking about uh, what it means to be an anonymous reviewer or at arm's length, right? So many of our practices in academia are about pretending we don't know each other, um, you know, or, or claiming that we only know each other through what we, what we publish, but not, not knowing someone is, is a sign somehow of a, of a, a valued relationship. Um, and what this book demonstrates is very much the opposite. So this culture of not knowing each other that is in academia is an isolating, solitary life, right? We may be in real or virtual classrooms with others, as professors, we may be in those spaces with our students, but we're always supposed to be cultivating distance, objectivity, authority, um, and that impacts us in all kinds of ways. Um, it means that we uh, fail to acknowledge each other's uh, real being in all kinds of ways. I can say, uh, just to give you an example, um, uh, two years after I left my last institution, 
uh, I received an email from a white male colleague asking me if I would be able to sit on a committee. Uh, he hadn't noticed that I'd left. Uh, why? I mean, he wouldn't. Why would he? He hadn't noticed me in the first place. Um, the culture of academic institutions is focused on individual success. Strengthening CVs and competition among colleagues. Professors are supposed to keep our heads down and stay productive and lift up our gaze just long enough to teach our classes. So I left that department where this colleague didn't know who I was and I came to St. Mary's and I arrived at the same time as my wonderful colleague, Dr. Bungeon. And in many ways, we've been on this journey together for the past five years. Um, we've both in the last couple of weeks received tenure as you heard. Um, and we have been working very hard to be seen in our institution in different ways. Uh, during this time, I am so grateful to have been able to witness the phenomenal investment of time and energy and love that Dr. Bunjan puts into the work of nurturing good relations. What the academic well-being of racialized students does throughout this book is make our relations with each other as colleagues, students, and collaborators visible. This is visible on the beautiful cover that you saw uh, by Bria Miller. Um, it's visible within the pages, within the work of its contributors. Um, I wanna focus on two aspects of this, which I think sort of bookend the volume in the introduction and the conclusion uh, that Benita has, has provided for us. In the introduction, after grounding her work and describing her own journey as a settler on indigenous land and as a woman of color navigating the academy, Dr. Vanjan describes with care how each contributor is connected with her, their journey together and how that relationship has been mutually nurturing. For those of you who read and engage with academic books, you'll know that this is not something that academics normally do. We don't expose our relations to each other, right? Remember, isolation and distance. Um, we, 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 this, this is uh, against the grain of the way institutions want us to operate. So by telling these stories, Benita is making visible to readers the experiences that are normally obscured in academia, the struggles and solidarities that people of color experience as we move through the academy as students and uh, as faculty. And what I find most striking about this is how Dr. Bunjan doesn't just describe the work that she did in mentoring students. This is not just about, not just about her labor. It's also about how each of these relationships has transformed her as a person and as a teacher. This book, and I can attest this for witnessing the work that she has done um, in person with my own eyes, is about developing a model for mentorship that is grounded in an ethics of mutual care, seeing students as whole people, and fostering relationships with students that allow them to see us also as whole people, as faculty and as mentors. Um, and I've been so fortunate to have been able to be um, uh, a sort of uh, a peripheral part of the, the conferences that Arsan has organized uh, to work with some of the students who have participated in these spaces and to see the, the, the care and meticulousness with which Benita has, has um, worked with these students over uh, this, these last five years um, and many years before that in BC. So I think this kind of model for mentorship is also reflected in the final chapter co-authored with Dr. Yvonne Brown, in which Dr. Bunjan reflects on her own experience when she was a young racialized student, and as she talked about at the beginning, um, and the mentorship she received from Dr. Brown. Uh, Dr. Brown also reflects on this relationship and how they fostered what they call together transnational kinship relations. Um, I think this concept is hugely uh, valuable and generative to me. I think that it allows us to see what a sort of multi-generational model of transformative mentorship can really look like. So through Dr. Brown and Dr. Bunjan and through this next generation of students whose work is published in this book, uh, the potential doctorates that we've heard from uh, speaking today and maybe moving into the next steps in academia uh, we get to witness mentorship as kinship. This is decolonizing work. It's challenging the institution's insistence on dehumanizing us by humanizing our relationships. The importance of indigenous settler color relations is foregrounded in every piece of this book. The thinking of how we can relate 
to each other, with each other in ways that challenge the white supremacy that pervades the fields and institutions we work in. So this is an important book for all these reasons. And it's for these reasons um, that I really wanna encourage you to pick up a copy. Um, this is a unique volume. There are very few works in Canada that address uh, the issues that are discussed in this book. And there are no books that do it the way this book does. Um, in Canada, we hear so much about reconciliation. We're used to those empty gestures. Uh, through, through the work of Dr. Bunjan and the students, we can start to see what is possible when we center the experiences of Indigenous and racialized students and elders and refuse and reject the reductive structures that we work in. The creative energy that each of our, our panelists has shown today in their work is what drives this change making. This, this, uh, the power of creative creativity and poetics. So I want to close just by saying a couple of words about the students' contributions, uh, the panelists that we heard from today. I've had the privilege of getting to know all of these folks and their time at SNU, and um, I've had opportunities to work with them at the conference and in their academic journeys. And um, I, it's just so amazing to see these words in print. Um, Fallon, uh, your piece describes the isolation and frustration of feeling overlooked, made invisible, marginalized. You write with this poetic voice and cadence, and I love that in reading your words, I can hear your voice. As someone who's had the opportunity to work with you, um, it's uh, it's so um, it's so exciting to see your words in print here, um, and to think about uh, the work that you're doing now and continuing to do. Um, Arthi, you've uh, written your own story, um, your narrative in which you expose the challenges of being a racialized international student navigating the institutional space at the university, and also are really foregrounding the critical importance of mentorship from the scholars of color who have guided you and showing how valuable that really is. Um, uh, Tammy, your poem about um, intentions, you know, good intentions, uh, are not enough, right? There's there's so much more that, that is necessary. And I think that really speaks to what this book brings us. Um, Diane's poem about refusing to be what institutions want her to be and that line, we protect the sacred, we preserve, we persist for and among ourselves. Um, that line is something that, uh, that I'm holding close to my heart. Um, I want to just end here with uh, a, a three questions that I want to ask to each of you, and uh, 